You know, this is the last night of um, spiritual renewal, and I'm incredibly excited about the privilege to play a part in it. And I was thinking, praying, reflecting on what I sense God might want to do tonight, what I hoped he would do. And for me, I believe times like these can be, if we'll lean in, they can be times of acceleration, spiritual acceleration. What do I mean by that? When we are dialed in, focused, undistracted, uninhibited, God can do more in a night than he could in months trying to sift through, fight for, vie for our focus and our attention. I believe tonight's going to be one of those nights for us. That God's going to speed some things up. You believe he can do that? So Lord, tonight we stand in the beginning of another year filled with endless opportunities for us to participate in what you want to do in our life. We stand grateful. Grateful for your faithfulness. For your provision you provided. For your protection you've protected. And we thank you for that. We stand tonight asking in some sense for marching orders for this year. Speak to us. Comfort us. Lead us. Guide us. And do a hard work tonight that accelerates our lives spiritually. I pray that you would bless those that are watching online. For you are not constrained by space. And I pray that you would honor the press of the people who are here tonight. As they have sacrificed as a reflection of their value for your presence. Honor that tonight. We're confident that you heard this prayer. You'll honor this petition. Thank you for this amazing church. Thank you for this stellar team. We thank you that our eyes haven't seen and our ears haven't heard, our heart has not conceived what you have in store for this region through this church. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated tonight. Um, so glad to be back home. Um, Want to read a few verses from a passage that may be familiar to many of you. Uh, for those to whom it may not be as familiar, we're going to get familiar with it tonight. And that's the 23rd Psalm. I want to read a few verses from the New International Version, beginning at verse 1. And I'm ready to teach tonight if you're ready to receive. If you're ready, say yes. <laughs> Psalms 23. Psalm of David, he says in verse one, the Lord's my shepherd. And because he's my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes, renews, restores my soul. He guides me along the right path for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and your love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I want to talk from this topic tonight. It's a, it's an affirmation. It's a declaration that gives me comfort stepping into a new year. And it's a conviction 
that I hold and try to hold as tightly as I can based on God's demonstration of his faithfulness in the past. Here it is. Hopefully it'll help all of us in some way this year. He knows where I'm going. He knows where I'm going. Family, as we prepare to explore this passage tonight, I like to inform some and remind others of a principle that Dr. Henry Cloud profoundly captures in his book, Necessary Endings. He simply suggests that entrances into new seasons must be preceded by exits from old ones. He argues masterfully that endings are not always evil, but that endings are necessary. He suggests that you cannot say hello to some new things unless you are willing to say goodbye to some old ones. So the course and the quality of all of our life is going to be greatly impacted by, influenced by, determined by what you're willing to leave. And as we stand in the middle or in the beginning of a brand new year, I feel like that principle is pertinent for all of us because I believe most, if not many of us in this room, want to experience some new things in 2018. Can I hear an amen there? Yeah. Some of us would even go so far to say, I want to experience some new problems. Not that I want any problems at all, but if you're like me, you grow weary of the same reoccurring cycle of the same issue year after year after year. And I believe what Dr. Cloud is arguing is incredibly important I think it is substantiated by scripture, and I think it's extremely pertinent for all of us who are believing for some new things in this new year. Am I making sense? And I think this is, this is important because I believe we all have a date with something we can't afford to stand up and we can't afford to miss. We have a date with God's intended end his preferred future, his desired destination for us, a date with destiny. Jeremiah, well, God talks about it through Jeremiah when Jeremiah informs God's people that he knows the plans that he has for us, plans not to harm us, plans to prosper us and to give us a hope and a future. I think what is key and critical when it comes to this, is that God says to Jeremiah, I know the plans. He didn't say, you know the plans. He said, I know the plans, which suggests that there are some things God intentionally does not let us in on. Therefore, if we're going to get to his intended end, his desired destination, his preferred future for our lives, it means we've got to say goodbye to something that many of us would rather keep. You've got to say goodbye to control. <laughs> when David makes the declaration that the Lord is my shepherd, he is in essence saying to the audience of that particular psalm. He is saying to you and to me that I see God as more than a savior. I see God as a shepherd. I see him who does, I see God as one who does more than save my life. I see God as one who leads my life. I see God as more than one who cleans up my past. I see him as one who guides my future. I see him as one who does more than handle my mishaps and my mistakes. I see him as one who orders my steps. It's, an, it's, it's as if in his 
seasoned, mature state in life, he's come to a revelation that I need to give up something I'd rather keep. I've got to give up control. The Lord is my shepherd. Am I making sense? I said, am I making sense? See, see, giving up, giving up control is difficult, but when we really think about it, it's logical because control is an illusion. Even when we think we have it, we don't. We can control how careful we are when we drive, but we cannot control how careful other people are when they drive. We can control how we construct the bid, but we cannot control whether or not the bid is accepted. We can control whether or not we put the offer on the property. We cannot control whether or not the offer is accepted. We can control how good our grades are, how pristine our application is, how well we interview, but we cannot control whether or not we get admitted or whether or not we receive the scholarship. We contribute, but we don't control. We influence, but we do not determine outcomes. Control is an illusion. And when we attempt to manipulate outcomes, what we end up doing is bearing the weight of something that we were never intended to bear. We're bearing God weight because only God can control outcomes. Am I making sense? And when we bear God weight, we crumble under the pressure of weight we were never intended to carry. Only God has shoulders that are broad enough to handle weight, to control outcomes, to speak to wind and wind stops blowing, to speak to lightning and thunder and thunder stops roaring. Only God can handle God weight. And some stress, some strain, some feelings of being overwhelmed, feelings of being inundated with anxiety are often consequences of us trying to carry something God never intended for us to carry. That's God weight. <laughs> you can't control the future. That's that's God way. You can have courageous conversations, but you cannot augment someone's behavior. That's God way. You can frame the argument as lovingly and as tactfully as you can, but you cannot make them accept and acquiesce, acquiesce and agree with what you're saying. That's God way. And when you carry God way, you crumble under the pressure because you are never intended to control outcomes. We control our decisions. God controls outcomes. The Lord <laughs> is my shepherd. Am I making sense? And when we get that revelation, right, when we, when we see, when we, when we see God this way and practically engage in the process of actually living this way, we can experience what the author of this particular psalm experience as he reveals to us the way that he sees God when he says the Lord is my shepherd. I think what's so amazing about the 23rd Psalm is not just who wrote it, David, not just what he says, but when he says it. This is interesting because this psalm is said to be written after David is a king. So he sits and reflects on his time shepherding his father's sheep and somehow puts pen to parchment and says, as I was to the sheep, so God is to me. The Lord is my shepherd. What I did for the sheep, God does for me. 
The way I protected the sheep, God has protected me. The way I led the sheep from where they were to where they needed to be. They didn't even know they were on their way to green pastures. And if they would have had their way, they would have veered from the path that I was leading them on. But 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 just like I led the sheep to places that they didn't know they were going to, but they were glad when they got there it is the same way David is saying God has led him as I was to the sheep. So God is to me the Lord. He says, is that right? The Lord, the Lord, the Lord. When you see that capital L O R D, the Lord Jehovah, Jehovah, which is his covenant name. It's almost like a prefix. He says, Jehovah is my shepherd. Jehovah is my shepherd, is his covenant name. Whatever comes after it is what he makes a covenant to be. <laughs> says, I make an agree. Whatever comes after Jehovah, God is saying, I make a covenant that I will be that when you need me to be it. When, when Abraham, when Moses asked Pharaoh, OK, what I'm um, asked God, OK, what name should I use? To describe you, God just says, I am, right? Jehovah, I mean, you're going to need me to be so much, I can't even tell you all of that now. I'm just going to give you the first part. And then when you get to a situation where I have to reveal an aspect of my existence and my personality that you need, then you just fill in the blank with whatever you need me to be. So Abraham needed me to be Jehovah Jireh, and I I was that for him. And Gideon needed me to be Jehovah Shalom, and I was that for him. Because whatever you need me to be, I'll covenant to be that. And David said, that's the one who's my shepherd. The Lord. Is, is, my, is my shepherd. It, it's, it's as if he looks at his life. He says, how in the world did I end up here? There is no logical explanation for where I am except there is someone who has insight that I don't have, foresight that I don't have, acumen that I don't have, that got me from where I am to where I are, where I am, where I was to where I am, that no strategic plan could have got me here. No life plan could have got me here. No vision board could have got me here. He looks at where he was and where he is. He says, the Lord has been my shepherd. And and if you're familiar with this story, then you understand exactly what we mean, right? Some people believe that David's narrative begins at 1 Samuel 16. I think it really precedes that. I think the context that David was called to kingship in is incredibly important. The the Bible is clear there was a period in Israel's history where they were led by religious and civil leaders called judges. And Israel would look at other nations who were led by kings and would want to emulate what they saw in other nations because too much exposure isn't good. Because too much exposure can awaken in us an appetite for things that aren't for us. And so Israel starts wanting what's for them. The grass isn't always greener on the other side, but they're overexposed. And because they're overexposed, it awakens in them an appetite for something that they want, but they really don't need. So they keep asking and asking and asking. And what God does is he gives them what they ask for. Not because, listen to me, not because they needed it or it was right, but he did it because when God can't teach us through instruction, he has to teach us through experience. He told them what would happen if they got a king. He told them what kings do, yet they still wanted a king. And so God allowed them to learn through experience what we what he would have preferred for them to learn through instruction. And so the very thing that God said would happen did happen. 
The king that they picked was a man named Saul from the tribe of Benjamin, and Saul served well for a season, but Saul's greatest failure was his success. Nothing fails like success. His greatest failure was his success because it's, it's difficult to be successful at being successful, and he became intoxicated with arrogance, right? He became intoxicated with arrogance, and because he became intoxicated with arrogance, he became a person who was not trustworthy. So God has to remove him and replace him. This is what's weird. God fires him, but he doesn't tell him. He tells the one who appointed him, Samuel, but he doesn't tell him. So he's occupying a role for a season not knowing he no longer has divine authorization. God, God removes him. Here it is. He removes him, not because he's imperfect, because the next king, David, had more moral, more grievous moral improprieties than Saul. But he removed Saul, not because he wasn't perfect, again, but because he wasn't trustworthy, because God can use people that aren't perfect. It's hard to use people he can't trust. He says, I gave you an assignment with the Amalekites, Saul. You didn't carry it out. So I can't trust you to carry out this assignment. So he, he removes him. And this is what happens. He tells the man that appointed him, Saul, Samuel. And the Bible says, <laughs> it begins 1 Samuel 16 by telling us that Samuel is crying. He's mourning over the fact that Saul's been rejected. He's upset. He's mourning. He's angry. And God asks him a question. How long will you mourn over that which I've rejected? In other words, your tears won't change my mind about what's best for my people. He says, so you're delaying your progress in the future because you're reminiscing a past. I'm not going to re reminiscing about a past. I'm not going to let you revisit. And no matter how much you mourn over that, he says, you're not going back to it. And this is this is what's interesting, family. Here it is. Samuel was upset that Saul had to leave. But what he didn't know is he would have been more upset if God let him stay. Because sometimes God will allow us to cry a little now to protect us from crying a lot later. Are you, are you following me, family? So this is what God does. He tells Samuel, listen, go down to Jesse's house because I've selected my king and he's in that house. So Samuel goes down to Jesse's house. He rolls up on Jesse. He say, Jesse... I need you to call all your sons because I'm here to pick a king. So Jesse calls seven sons. The first son, he walks out. I mean, he just, just swag is on 10. He walks out. Eliab, swag is on 10. He says, and Samuel says, oh, this, this is the Lord's anointing. He, he walked like a king. He, he looks like a king. And, and God says to Samuel, mm-mm. Man looks at the outward appearance. I look at the heart. He says, the criteria you use to determine who should occupy certain roles in my kingdom is not the criteria that I use. I'm not going to bother this, but Samuel was a prophet, was he not? So one word the Old Testament uses to describe a prophet is a seer. He's a seer. The seer couldn't see. Listen to this. Seven of Jesse's sons come before Samuel. None of them get the green light as king. So Samuel's confused. So he asks, he says, are these all your kids? This is the Daniel's version, I'm paraphrasing. Samuel says, <laughs> Jesse says, no, uh-uh. But I got one more, but I didn't even call him because I know he's not the one. Samuel says, send for him. We will not sit down and I will not leave until he comes. And the Bible says that David comes. He looks nothing like his brother. You wouldn't look at him on the outside and see 
that he had kingly material on the inside. And, and the, Bible, the Bible suggests that as he comes before Samuel, they had this ram's horn that was hollow and empty on the inside and they put the oil on the inside and as David came before that ram's horn, that oil flowed. Some historians have suggested, some uh, commentators have intimated that Samuel tried to pour the oil on all seven of the sons but that the oil wouldn't flow. But when David got there, the oil flowed freely. Don't miss it. Seven people got to the horn before David. But the oil didn't move. Some commentators suggest. But when the eighth person, David, got there, the oil moved. Seven people got there first. And it didn't move. But when David got there, it moved. Seven people got there first. But when David got there, it moved. Which suggests to me that when God has something reserved for you and me, it doesn't matter who gets there first. Did you hear what I just said? I said, if God has something for you and for me, it doesn't matter who gets there first. They can apply first, they can get there first, they can meet them first, they can put in the bid first, but if God has it reserved for you, it doesn't matter who gets there before you, he'll hold it in place until you get there. If you missed it, it wasn't yours, because when it's yours, he will keep it there until you get there. If you believe that, come on and give him praise right there. So here it is, as a prepared wrap up, here it is. So David's sitting there, he's all oily, head greasy, just oil everywhere, just greasy. He's sitting there greasy. And then this is what happens. The Bible says, so to me, the weirdest scripture in the whole narrative, he's just sitting there, he's just greasy. And the Bible says that... <laughs> that Samuel, the one who anointed him, leaves and goes to Ramah. So David's probably sitting there, greasy, saying, so you just poured all this oil on my head and then you left. Are you, are you going to, uh, <clears throat> you going to, you going, you going to send the chariot back to, to pick me up? You just anointed me as a king, but you left me where I was. Now, I, I could take you to a text, a scripture in 1 Samuel, where the Bible says that from that day, from when he was anointed, it says, it says from that day forward, the power of God came on David greatly. From that, so he's empowered in a unique way immediately. So his ability changed, but his responsibility didn't. He's got the ability of a king, but still the responsibility of tending to his father's sheep. It's a God gap. When what you are doing and what you can be doing don't match. When your oil and your assignment don't match. When your practices and your potential don't match. What's up with the God gap? Shouldn't David have gone immediately? Why would God leave that space in time there? You'll see why, because it's interesting, because back at the palace, Saul is having some mood challenges. <laughs> Put it that way. He's dealing with what the Bible calls distressing spirits. So during those days, <laughs> one, of, one of the ways that they attempted to remedy that was through music. So the Bible says, as those who are close to him are having conversations about how to deal with this distressing spirit and these mood swings, listen to this. It says, we need to find a musician. Does anybody know one? And someone who was in Saul's circle said, let's call for one of the sons of Jesse. 
I heard him. King James Version puts it this way. It says, he's a cunning player on the harp. Now, the Bible never tells us who recommended David. It never tells us who saw David playing. We just know someone spoke up and their voice was so valued that everybody adhered to it and got David to be a musician to play for Saul. Which means that David was playing and somebody from Saul's cabinet was watching and he didn't even know it. Somebody might be watching you. Did you hear what I just said? You never know who's watching you. David could have felt undervalued, could have felt unappreciated, could have felt he was like he was being looked over, but he had no idea that God had somebody in the right place at the right time who saw his gift, who didn't need it at the moment, but they logged it in their memory. And then when time met opportunity, the Holy Spirit brought David's name back to that remembrance and presented an opportunity for him. And somebody in here may feel forgotten, you may feel looked over you may feel like your gift is being unappreciated but I want you to know that just like it happened for David and Joseph God's got a way of logging you in somebody's memory and when the right problem comes at the right time the Holy Spirit will bring your name back up to their remembrance and put you in position in the palace so David is playing right playing for Saul And what ends up happening is he never abandons his responsibility at his daddy's house. He says, I'm never leaving this place because this this is where I got found. (laughs) Even though even though my daddy had a king in the house and didn't know it. So I'm not going to bother that the kind of resentment I would have had to work through because you called seven of my brothers and you didn't call me. And you're my father. And you couldn't even see the king in me. You know me best, but I feel like you know me the least. What do you do when you feel like the people you want to see you don't see you? But in the midst of all of that, so, see, it's, it's so much in that because I think he had I think he had some kind of rejection and performance orientation issues. I think that's the way he reason he stuck around Saul so long is Saul throwing spears at him. I'm like, you got one time to throw a spear at me. <laughs> like he kept dodging spears. I'm reading it like, how do you keep dodging spears? It's like you went back. <laughs> right. So so much in that. But he 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 never left his father's house. Right. And so if his father's house is a metaphor for God's house, there's a lesson in there for us that no matter what happens outside the house, never leave the house. I got found in the house. I got anointed in the house. If it wasn't for the house, I wouldn't have an opportunity that I have in the palace. Here it is. So one day he's going, so he's going, he's working for Saul, tending to his dad's sheep. So one day he's going back to work. He's leaving his dad's house, going back to work. And his dad says, hey, take some food and supplies to your brothers who are in the military. So David's going back to work. He takes some supplies and food to his brothers. And while he's doing so, he, he, eavesdrop, he, he overhears this Philistine giant who's throwing shade and just insulting the armies of Israel. So David's, I can imagine, this is the Daniel's version. David is, he's walking up with the stuff and he's like, so nobody hear him? No, nobody hear that? Hold this food. <laughs> hold, hold this. Come on now. Some of y'all can relate. You say, but you still got a little bit, you got to keep that part of you down because every now and then you're like, oh, wait a minute, what they say? Hold this. (laughs) Hold hold this. (laughs) So, (laughs) so, so everyone's afraid to challenge him. I won't won't get into this representative battles where, you know, people would pick 
One person from each side and whoever won that battle was representative of that particular side winning the whole battle, etc. So David says, okay, no one will fight him. He says, so, he says, but this is an uncircumcised Philistine. And every time he refers to him initially, the first few times he refers to him, he refers to him that way, which tells us something. Everybody saw he was a giant. David saw he was uncircumcised. They look at the same thing, but they see something different because it's not what you're facing. It's the story you tell yourself. So they saw the same thing and they told themselves one story. He told himself another story. They say he's big. David says he's uncircumcised, which circumcision is a symbol of the covenant. So he's saying he doesn't have a covenant with God. He's got size, but he didn't have covenant. He's got a sword, but he didn't have a covenant. He's got strength, but he didn't have a covenant. He's got a spear, but he doesn't have a covenant. He has armor, but he doesn't have a covenant. I have an agreement with God that he doesn't have. God said he fight my battles. God said he'd be my defender and my protector. God said, are y'all following me here? And so he, 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 he says, he says, well, I'll fight him. So word gets back to Saul that David will fight. Here it is, word gets back to Saul that David will fight. So he goes to Saul, and Saul says, well, first of all, David asks, he says, okay, all right, he's disrespecting God, I'm thinking about this, but first of all, I'm a man of sense, Uh, what shall be given to the man who wins? (laughs) They said, well, he's going to get one of the king's daughters. He said, okay, all right, all right, all right. No taxes. Oh, I'm in. I'm in. No taxes? I'm in. I'm in. So he, <laughs> he goes before Saul, and Saul basically says, listen, you don't fit the typical profile of a person who wins battles like these. And David leaned on experience that most in Saul's position wouldn't find credible. David said, well, I was taking care of my father's sheep and a lion and a bear came to attack the sheep and God helped me defeat the lion and the bear. And he said, the same God that delivered the lion and the bear into my hands will deliver this uncircumcised Philistine into my hands also. This is interesting because I'm sure when David was dealing with the lion and the bear when it was happening, it felt like agitation. But some trials that feel like agitation are really preparation. Because if it wasn't for the lion and the bear, he would not have cultivated the confidence that he needed to fight Goliath. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Some things that feel like agitation are really education. God is teaching us. He taught David about his ability to defend and protect him. He taught David about his ability to aid and assist him in overcoming what he could not overcome on his own. And David took that confidence into his battle with Goliath. So Saul says, okay, well, if you're going to do this, you need the right equipment. So he he gives David his armor and he gives David his weapon. And David out of honor, put it on, and he walked around in it, the text says. But then he came back and he said, I can't wear these. I know everybody historically has done it this way, but I can't do it the way everybody else has done it. And I know people go to battle and they wear this, but I can't wear what everyone else wears. And I know this is the box all warriors fit in, but I can't fit in this box. And I know you've never seen anybody do it my way, but if you let me get my rocks, I can do with my rocks what other people can't do with a spear. And sometimes in life, you gotta have the courage to know what armor to take off. Did you hear what I just said? To, to, to not allow others to impose on you their armor that they use to win their battles. Because just because that armor helped you win 
doesn't mean it's going to help me win. And it takes courage to say, if you'll just let me use the rocks God has given me, I'll knock that giant down. Here it is. You know the story. David goes to the brook, takes five smooth stones. The Bible tells us he takes five. Is that right? But he only uses one. Which meant that wasn't the first time he used that slingshot. The Bible tells us he hits him in the place where he's unexposed in the forehead. He hits him from a distance. So although the rocks seem like a disadvantage, they were actually an advantage because Goliath's strength doesn't matter if you can't get close to me. Did you hear what I just said? <laughs> yeah, his, 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 strength, his, his strength is only an advantage in close combat. But he didn't have weapons that would reach as far as David's. Sometimes you're looking at what you don't have when what God wants to do is to show you that you may not have their strength, but they don't have your reach. Okay. <laughs> Y'all follow me here? Okay, so this is what happens. He knocks Goliath down. I, that would have been done. I would have been done. He's that big. I'm not getting close. Uh, but David runs to him, takes Goliath's sword. So he takes what the enemy would have used against him, and he uses it against the enemy. He takes Goliath's sword, and he cuts off Goliath's head because he wants to make sure that the giant isn't just down, but it's dead. Because some things we think are dead, they're just down. And we don't finish it off, and then we move to a new season of life, and that old problem resurrects itself. And then that old problem follows us into a new season, and then new seasons keep feeling like old seasons because we keep dealing with old problems because we knocked it down, but you didn't cut the head off. So from that, through a series of different events, David becomes king. So he's sitting probably in the palace asking himself, I think what I ask myself sometimes, how did I get here? Because I wouldn't be in the palace if Israel hadn't saw me as king. Israel wouldn't have seen me as one who was king if they weren't celebrating my victory. They wouldn't be celebrating my victory and singing songs about me like Saul has slain thousands and David tens of thousands if I hadn't defeated Goliath. I wouldn't have defeated Goliath if I hadn't fought Goliath. I wouldn't have fought Goliath if I hadn't heard Goliath insulting Israel. I wouldn't have heard Goliath insulting Israel if I wasn't around. I wouldn't have been around if I wasn't bringing supplies and food to my brothers. I wouldn't be bringing supplies and food to my brothers if I wasn't working in the palace. I wouldn't be working in the palace if Saul hadn't got distressing spirits. And I wouldn't be working in the palace if someone hadn't seen me play my harp. And no one would have seen me play my harp if I wasn't playing my heart and I wouldn't have had that divine opportunity if the oil wasn't on my head. The oil wouldn't be on my head if Samuel didn't put it there. Samuel wouldn't have put it there if he didn't come to Jesse's house. He wouldn't have had a reason to come to Jesse's house unless God had rejected Saul. So for all of his love for God, for all of his heart criteria for all of the amazing attributes of David, none of them could have got him where he was. Maybe we're taking too much responsibility for our success. Because you want to know how I got here? I got here because one year I was speaking at a conference in Dallas and there was a guy who happened to be there named Ron Luce. And Ron Luce happened to have a conversation with me about tribes. And he spoke to me about an organization called ARC. And he said he wanted to hook me up with a man named Chris 
Hodges. We exchanged numbers. Chris Hodges just happened to be doing a round table in New York. I lived in New Jersey. We just happened to connect and I went to the round table. I went to Birmingham. I spent a day with him. He invited me to this conference. I went to this conference. We're in church all day. I've been in church all my life. So after being in church all day, I love Jesus, but I was tired of church. So my wife and I wanted to go back and look at the beach there in Florida. But we got invited to go to this pastor's house for this reception. We decide against our best logic to go to the house. We go to the house, we're hungry. I'm standing there alone. My wife is at the food table getting some food. I'm standing by myself and this tall Hispanic man walks over to me, looks at a messenger bag I have on my shoulder and says, give me that bag. I said, Ex uh -huh. excuse me, I'm Darius, who? <laughs> We introduce ourselves. My wife walks back over momentarily with food and he looks at her. I've never met this man before. He looks at my wife and looks at me and says, is this your wife? I said, yes. He looks at me and says, how did you get her? <laughs> and he reached out his hand, extended it to my wife and said, hi, my name is Jacob Aranza. That initiated a relationship that years later has manifested in the dis. You can't plan that. Yeah, yeah. Are you following me? Yeah. I'm done. Listen. <laughs> Listen. I got picked up. Pastor Jacob picked my wife and I up to come here tonight. I'm riding in the passenger seat. I have no anxiety at all. I'm relaxed and I have no idea where we're going. I knew we were coming here, but if I were to have to drive here by myself, I wouldn't be able to do it because I don't know the way. But I'm in the car, relaxed, excited about being here, even though I didn't know where I was going. But I had no anxiety, no stress, because I was riding with somebody who did. So I didn't have to stress, because he knows where I'm going. And he knows the best route to get us here on time. And when you made a decision to make Jesus the Lord of your life, what you did was you got in the car with him. And you need to sit in the passenger side and arrest anxiety and stress because even though you don't know where you're going, he knows where you're going and he knows how to get you there on time. He is my shepherd and I will lack nothing. So today, I think the Holy Spirit is challenging us to control less and to trust more. I think tonight the Holy Spirit wants to deal with some of our unnecessary stress. And some of the unnecessary care that we're carrying, that we're instructed to cast on him. Peter says, cast all your cares on him. Why? Because he cares for you. That he is saying, you don't have to carry that. That is too much for you to carry. Some of you, some of us, we're crumbling under God weight. And not only is tonight a night of acceleration, this is what I believe God wants to do 
tonight is also a night of exchange. It's a night where he says, take my yoke upon you. You learn from me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. And I know some of you are wired like me. And you want to know what's happening, when it's happening, and if it's broke, you want to fix it. And you want to fix it immediately. And you have no idea the pressure you've been carrying. It's miraculous that some of us haven't crumbled under the pressure of trying to fix what you can't fix. Trying to control what you can't control. And tonight, the Holy Spirit is saying to us, I no longer want you to live that way. I didn't build you to carry that. You give it to me, I can carry it. I can handle it. It's too much. And you're tired. And you're worn down. And you are worrying. And you're not resting. Jesus said, I want to give you rest. And it's too much to keep carrying. And God wants you to know, I know where you're going. And I know how to get you there on time. But you'll never get there if you're carrying this. Tonight, the Holy Spirit wants to help you. You don't have to carry it any longer. I use, Watchman Nee says, you get to the point, if you're spiritually maturing, you'll get to the point where you use the words of the Bible to describe an experience you're having. Paul DeJong says, it's, it's not just knowledge you have, it's a revelation you carry. The conviction is deeper when you've seen it in your own life. Because once, once you've been exposed to something, you can't unexpose me. You can tell me whatever theory you want to tell me. If I've been burned, you can't give me a philosophy that tells me fire's not hot. And I'm telling you not just, I don't have this perfectly, but when I tell you, when I tell you I've lived this and that God will help you, I'm telling you what I know. He'll help you. You don't have to keep carrying this. He wants you to breathe. You can't breathe. It's suffocating the life out of you. The joy of the Lord is being suffocated because you're carrying God weight. We got men who are carrying so much weight, but as a man, you're screaming silently. And if you don't give it to God, you're gonna implode. You're strong, but he's stronger. And he's saying, son, I wanna help you. I got two boys, and I already got a bad back, but I'd break it if I saw them carrying something that was killing them. I'd break it to carry it and my heart would be broke first. And I believe God's looking at some of us and saying, my heart is breaking because I don't want you carrying that. We're going to go, but I want to pray for you tonight. And if you're here and you say, Pastor Darius, God is talking to me. And I don't want to go into the rest of this year carrying this, but I need God to help me. He's your helper. And I want to pray for you. And I want you as a physical sign of your spiritual journey. If you're able, would you just come to the altar? You come from wherever you are. And God is going to help.
help us tonight. It's too much. It's too much. that before you let it go practically you got to let it go emotionally so right here in this moment in the privacy of your own heart I want you to let it go I can't control this I can't. I'm trying and it's killing me of exchange we give you what we have you give us what you have we give you ashes you give us beauty we give us tea we give you tears you give us joy we give you the spirit of heaviness you give us the garment of praise and I pray tonight in Jesus name that this would be a time of supernatural exchange we cast our cares upon you knowing you care for us. And I pray that you would help everyone at this altar the way you helped me. You did it for David. You did it for Joseph. Lord, you did it and you're doing it for me. And I pray that you do it to them. May they live with the revelation that they can control their decisions, but they cannot control outcomes. So I pray that you be more than their savior tonight. May tonight be the night that they look at their life and said, at spiritual renewal, Jesus became my shepherd. And he knows the path I need to be on. He knows the pace I need to walk at to get me there. He knows the pit stops that I need to take. And he knows what my green pasture needs to be like. Lord, lift the burden. Do it tonight. We leave here lighter. We leave here freer. We leave here more confident. And we pray now for a resurrection of peace. May peace that was dead be resurrected. May joy that was dead be resurrected. May focus that was dead be resurrected. May life that was dead be resurrected. May they feel like a new creature from this day forward. In Jesus' mighty name.
if you agree and if you believe all over this room give God an offering of thanksgiving give him praise all over this house come on family come on make his praise glorious